Yeah. All right. And Zoom is preparing to go live. All right. Great. And I'm not going to. Uh, uh, I'll circle back and pull the recording. Hey, we got Larry. Larry Ham on with us. Thank you, Larry. All right. Are you are you uh, recording there, uh, Junior? Um, no, you say you're recording, but I can't record. Uh, I'm you're going to have to because it keeps saying, please request permission. From Perfectly you. fine. Hi, Larry. Hi, everybody. I'm, right, I'm, we got it. We got it. Yes, sir. I, I'm glad we have somebody on, on the line who's young enough to know how to do all this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... uh, Helps. Definitely. Yes. The next generation of leaders. <laughs> do me a favor and uh, unmute Larry. Unmute Rick. All right, I am unmuting everybody. Okay, I'm there you go. You. All right, here's Larry. And you're on mute. I think John is the only one that we kind of try to get in, but we're behind time, so let me just go ahead and make this schedule go. Okay. Okay. All right. Are we ready? And I'm just want to make sure that we are officially live. No, there's something going on with the website on this side. All right, no problem. Well, we're live on the YouTube side. It looks. All right, I need you to start your recording. All right, and we are recording in five, four, three, two, record it. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Image Profile Report. I'm your host, Herb Glenn. Today, we're gonna have an opportunity to be able to share information that's important in relationship to the circumstances that we're going through currently. Many of us are concerned about the way in which the situation is being handled, how is it being dealt with in a way that it affects our community in particular, but in the American community as a whole, there are a number of individuals who are afraid. There are a number of individuals who are uh, not informed properly. And we have an opportunity today to be able to talk directly to an individual who has been one of the pioneers behind the opportunity to be able to develop a way in which we can normalize our communities again. Today, we have with us on our panel, the special guest of Dr. Brian Strom, who is the inaugural chancellor of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences and the executive vice president for health affairs at Rutgers University. During his five years at Rutgers, Dr. Strom has spearheaded the creation of an interpersonal faculty practice group, the Rutgers Health Group, established a formal partnership with RWJ Barnabas Health to create New Jersey's largest and most comprehensive academic health system and led a major recruitment drive to bring the nation's most talented biomedical researchers and clinicians to Rutgers. Prior to joining Rutgers, Dr. Strom was the Executive Vice Dean of Institutional Affairs and the founding chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology a founding director of the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics and founding director of the graduate program in epidemiology and biostatistics at the Perelman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. At this time, what I wanted to do is introduce you to an opportunity. Uh, let me see, do I have the ability to share? You should, yes. Okay. All right, well, I'm not able to share. So what we're gonna do is go straight to our guest. Um, and before I do that, let me introduce the distinguished panel that we have today that's really being a part of today's conversation. We have Ms. Deborah Smith Gregory, who is the president of the Newark NAACP. Uh, we have Mr. Lawrence Ham, who's the distinguished chairman of the People's Organization for Progress. We have uh, Mr. Thomas Ellis, who heads uh, a community outreach program called Enough is Enough. Ms. Jahada Sharif. Jahada, it's really a pleasure to know that you're with us today, who's a community activist and has a really important program that recognizes how to be able to influence our youth to know how to develop healthy habits. We have, uh, Mr. John Smith, who should be joining us directly. And we have my firstborn, the man who carries my heart in his hand all the time, the financial counselor of our family, Mr. Gregory Glenn. Thank you all for participating in today's uh, presentation. 
Dr. Strom, uh, we're very happy to have you here. And um, as I glance over all of the accolades and the information that you sent to us, and I'm sure that we're going to be able to cover a great deal of it in this presentation, I recognize that it's obvious you wanted to be a doctor before you could walk. <laughs> Uh, maybe I actually re maybe in in reality I did, but I resisted it. In fact, um, my, mo most of the time I actually didn't decide to be a doctor until I was in high school, until I was in college. So I, right? I, I yeah I went through multiple different. Um, my parents expected I was going to be a doctor, so I did everything but go along with that. So so uh, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't let your son hear that, but it's a. <laughs> the... <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's really great because my doctor, uh, my doctor daughter who is in her uh, master's degree program out in Massachusetts, went through one of the um, programs that Rutgers, uh, at that time it was the University of, of uh, UMDNJ. And uh, what they offered was a, um, a, a pre-med type program for, un, uh, for high school uh, uh, students. And uh, she went through that and now uh, she's going on to, to become um, somewhat of a medical doctor. And I'm very proud of that. The influences that are developed out of these institutions are very um, important. And especially as they are reflective to the hard work that many of the individuals who are on the panel today put blood, sweat, and tears in to continue to have that type of an influence in our community. As you know, we have the largest minority community in the state of New Jersey. And a number of individuals um, need to continue to get the inspiration to know that they can be a part of what's happening at UMDNJ. Um, relatively, with that understanding of your vast amount of responsibility, and certainly it appears and shows very well that you're talented enough to handle it, um, there are a number of different institutional environments, and as well as a medical involvement that you oversee. Can you talk a little bit about it? Sure, and and you know, your points are are terrific points in terms of more broadly. I think everybody knows about our medical school, New Jersey Medical School, and and obviously our New Jersey Medical School provides the medical staff for University Hospital. University Hospital is not under us. Um, that in the um, integration or separation, however you call it, when UMDNJ disappeared and moved into Rutgers, uh, University Hospital was spun out as a separate institution. But we provide all the medical care and people know about our docs providing the medical care um, at, at University Hospital. But we have a number of other important uh, entities. We, we have, uh, again, of course, based in Newark, uh, the biggest and one of the best, usually the seen as the best or second best school of health professions in the country, gen, uh, training physician assistants, dental assistants, 40 something different professions. And the, the number of different opportunities we can give to people in Newark is, is enormous. The, the dental school is based there um, in, in Newark as well. We have a school of public health, which is originally based in Piscataway, but in the last few years has expanded into Newark in a major way. We've opened a, se a separate new department of urban and global health based in Newark, which has been very involved in Newark. And I can talk about that, that more if, if, you, if you want. We have a graduate school. Um, for biological sciences, for people who want to uh, train to do laboratory work, um, you know, lots of different nursing school, of course, which is large. We had, we had there were two separate schools, both based in Newark, the, the old Rutgers School, the old UMD and J School, both of them emerged, and we have one of the largest nursing schools in the country. Enormous opportunities to be able to offer the people in Newark, and all right near nearby. Uh, am I clear to, to say that you really don't have much to do with the hospital itself, but most of the institutional values in terms of the academics? From a management point of view, that's completely correct. I am on the board of the hospital, to be clear, but but we don't manage the hospital. Um, the hospital is not not owned by us. It is owned by the state and 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 controlled by the state. Uh, we can influence it as a board member, but you know we help choose the new CEO, for example to help turn around as board members, to help turn around the hospital. But the management of the hospital is separate from us. The management of, of the educational enterprise and the clinical outpatient enterprise. So our docs provide the care in the hospital. Our docs provide the care outside the hospital. 
as well. But we don't directly manage the hospital. That's really a separate institution. How do you interact with RUCDR? RUCDR is part of Rutgers. So Rutgers overall has four chancellorships. That is the chancellor for New Brunswick, not health. The chancellor for Newark, not health. The chancellor for Camden, not health. And the chancellor for health, which is me, um, as bi biomedical and health sciences. <clears throat> so we are, our part is um, based primarily in Newark, but also uh, a chunk in New Brunswick and little bits in other parts of the state. RUCDR is part of the university, which is part of Rutgers, New Brunswick. So it's not directly under me, but given I, one of my roles is executive vice president for health affairs for the entire university. So anything dealing with health, even if it's not under me as chancellor, I oversee uh, uh, accordingly. So for example, student health services, we, we have in RBHS two student, two separate student health programs, one in Newark and one in New Brunswick. Those are for our students, but the Rutgers Newark students have their own separate student health. The Rutgers New Brunswick students have their own separate student health. They're all under me and my executive vice president, the health affairs role in a coordinating role, but not directly reporting role. So RUCDR doesn't directly report to me, but I've given my role as, as a head physician in the university, and especially given my role as an epidemiologist as well in this time of, of COVID-19, um, I've had a lot to do with RUCDR. Uh, in, in the process. One of the ironies, you know, I'm a physician, I'm also an epidemiologist and also a clinical pharmacologist. <clears throat> we always used to walk around with t-shirts going, no, I'm not a skin doctor. Uh, one, of the, one of the advantages of COVID-19 is now people know what epidemiologists do. Right. <laughs> and and is, issues of pandemics, uh, in fact, I've been very involved in from a national point of view long before COVID-19. Mm. The, the, this was not a surprise. The, the, um, the, the state is, was a, somewhat better prepared than some states, less prepared than others. The country was dramatically underprepared. Uh, a lot of the national preparation that had been done got dismantled in Washington, unfortunately. But, but uh, Newark has really become a leader in trying to lead the state back. But I'm sure we'll talk more about that. You know, you're right, because there are so many medical institutions that have been involved in the race for the cure. And it has uh, really become very much a task to try to identify who is who and where everything really sits. We know that there are a number of different ways in which uh, the opportunity for uh, care has been developed in relationship to COVID-19. And uh, one of them, as we understand, has been uh, a screening process uh, and another has actually been a testing process. Um, you have uh, been actively involved in looking at what has been developed through the institution um, in regard to the testing process. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Sure. I, you know, clearly our largest role in this whole epidemic has been providing care. We have a thousand providers. We, we have been the front line providing care particularly at University Hospital, particularly in Newark, and have been assisting University Hospital in lots of ways. Again, we don't oversee it, but for example, we closed our dental clinics so that our dental chairs could be taken out. And that area, because it has oxygen and other things in it, could be used for expansion space for University Hospital. We made parking lot space available to be able to, to unfortunately, to house extra bodies because of all the people who are dying from it. There, there are lots and lots of ways we've helped University Hospital. But one of the ways Rutgers has gotten best known has been testing, as, as you alluded to. And we really have two separate uh, tests. One of them was developed by David Aland in Newark um, and uh, at New Jersey Medical School. Um, and, and that's what's referred to as a point of care test. So uh, you um, uh, do the testing by getting specimens from the mouth, from the nose. It's not a comfortable process to collect the specimens. The person collecting the specimen has to be in full protective gear as well. But once the specimen is taken, you can get an answer in 45 minutes. And that's really useful in um, at clinical care. Um, University Hospital has been using it a lot. Is this a learning. swab test? Uh, that's a swab. Well, all of the ones except the saliva are swab tests. Okay. This is a 
there's a particular swab test that we can get an answer in, in 40 minutes. Okay. Is okay. this the one that we're kind of using more abundantly in the, uh, in the New Jersey area? We're using that a lot, but we're also using the saliva test a lot. And, and they, well, they, we're using both. They both well, can you break down both. a little bit? Where, where are we using the swab and where are we using the saliva? So clinical sites typically use the swab test. Um, and because, and particularly David Alon's swab test, because you can get the answer in 40 minutes. You, you know, the, the typical tests also using swab, now we can do it with saliva out of our UCDR, as you were alluding to, uh, takes 24 to 48 hours, which is a big improvement compared to early in the epidemic, where it took a week or, or 10 days, but it takes 24, 48 hours. If you show up at the University Hospital emergency room with symptoms, you don't want to wait 24, 48 hours to find out if you have COVID. So the advantage of the point of care test is we can get an answer for you in less than an hour for whether or not it's positive. So that swab test um, done as a point of care test um, is can give you an answer very quickly. And that's used in clinical sites, um, like, like University Hospital as an example. Some physician practices, mostly it's used in hospitals. And, and it has a big advantage to be able to treat people quickly. But, it, but the swabbing, the sampling is hard. It means the person doing the swab, the sampling, has to be in full protective gear to protect themselves. The patient sampling is uncomfortable. You're basically taking what amounts to a Q-tip and sticking it far up your nose and another Q-tip and sticking it way in your back in order to get the sample. And all of the prior testing including David Alon's test, until now, used that approach. The other approach that was developed at RUCDR that you had mentioned is a saliva test. And the advantage of that is speed in collection of the specimen. You basically can drive through, spit in a cup and hand it off. You know, the, the, the shortages you hear about in the press, uh, initially we had enormous shortages of testing. As the tests became more common, People, the politicians were saying, oh, the tests are more common, the tests are more common. They are, but the swabs weren't common enough. We couldn't get enough swabs to sample people. And then we couldn't get enough viral media where you put the swab in to carry it to the lab so that there were significant supply chain problems so that the tests theoretically were available, but they weren't widely enough useful. The beauty of the saliva test is takes two minutes. You spit in a cup, you, you turn it over. We can run already 10,000 such tests a day. Where? I mean, um, it, um, I, I mean, I know there's a coordinated effort in regard to it. And uh, we want to really understand the passion behind it because of, you know, the spread of the virus itself, but the shelter in place and other areas that we want to try to uh, change. Uh, this hopefully will help identify individuals and that we can get treatment more quickly. When is it going to be available abundantly? Do we have the necessary equipment to get it done? And how will it be coordinated? Great questions. Um, so let, let me try to clarify. Right now, the tests are run in Piscataway. RUCDR is in Piscataway. Mm -hmm. So the specimens have to get to them. The, we have enough now, enough equipment, enough uh, enough. Um, reagent enough of everything to run 10,000 a day. We can gear that up to 50,000 a day. Um, we are now, however, as a state, running only about 7,000 a day of all tests. So why is there that disconnect with, is, is, is the uh, obvious question. And it's, we're beginning to gear up. So for example, um, and in Newark, and we're working closely with the city of Newark, we're talking about testing 100,000 people, gearing up to test 100,000 people. So we understand, I understand those people are pretty much elderly people and institutionalized individuals. When will it get to the community? We, well, when it, when it gets to 100,000, it will get more broadly to the community. But, mm -hmm. but it, what we were starting is, for example, in prisons, and we're working um, uh, because uh, and elderly, nursing homes, uh, developmental centers, high-risk people are getting it first. The next level of people who will get it, they haven't gotten it yet, but we'll get it, are gonna be healthcare workers. So as we open up the hospitals to be able to take care of people, we don't wanna make our patients sick by having the healthcare workers pass the disease to the patients. 
So healthcare workers and patients, patients have always been tested when they present sick. The, the real question is asympt asymptomatic patients, and you're asking asymptomatic people, and you're asking exactly the right question. So the next level people will then be uh, homeless people because they travel from place to place and can pass the disease from place to place if, if they're positive. Um, prisoners, because it, it's spreading around the prisons and from the prisoners to the guards who go home and from the and get people sick and from the guards back to the prisoners. So, so we're, we're uh, launching it throughout the prison system of New Jersey and we're working now with Essex County Correction Correctional Facility to do it there too. So we're trying to plan, I mean, one of the things to realize is testing by itself is critical, but it's not enough. Testing has to be combined with a contact tracing system. So when someone is positive, you want to identify the person, have them quarantine themselves, but you want to go to all of the people they have been with recently, test them also. And if they're positive, quarantine them. So if you don't combine the testing with a trace a con a tracing system and, and quarantine system, it isn't going to do any good. They have to come together. And so we've been working with um, uh, the city of Newark, which has really been a leader in this, to be able to plan the, the trace and quarantine system. And Perry Halkidis, who's our dean of public health, is, is a co-chair of a committee for Newark to a public health committee in terms of re-entry into the economy. And as they plan a, uh, um, and with others, Ray Chambers and other people in Newark, to sort of plan, how do we deploy these tests? The mayor is committed he wants to test 100,000 people. And our advice to him has been, been, let's use this technology carefully. Don't just test because otherwise you're just gonna waste all the money. You're, you're gonna tell people they're positive or not positive. You know, um, eventually we'll have enough testing to handle the worried well. But right now, before we handle the worried well, we wanna handle the elderly, the nursing homes, the, the healthcare workers, prisoners, um, and, and then move on to homeless people, first responders, policemen, uh, grocery store operators, people who are interacting more with the public, who if they're sick, you wanna pull them out. But you also need the, the tracing capability of when it's a positive, go to all of their friends, all of their family, test all of them as well, because you wanna pull them out of circulation as well. Otherwise, we're just gonna be spreading this virus around continuously. One of the things that's important to realize with testing is you can be negative today and positive tomorrow. So testing just tells yeah. what you are that day. Hello. Okay, uh, I think that uh, this is a good time to transition into um, the panel discussion. Um, let me look at uh, Mrs. Uh, Sharif, Jahada Sharif. Uh, why don't we hear a question from you to Dr. Strom? Um, Can I just say first, um, first that you didn't introduce that I am the founder of the Creative Spirits of the state of New Jersey. And this is the organization 501c3 that I started 41 years ago. And my interest is not just health. We address many issues that affect our community. As far as health is concerned, I recently initiated a program to get tobacco out of the community, which brings us to this here coronavirus issue today. Because one of the things that tobacco does is destroys the respiratory. And I do have that problem. I learned 10 years ago for many years of smoking that my lungs have been affected and I've lost a lot of my lung ability. And with this being known, one of the things I believe that should be addressed in our community, let's stop selling tobacco. Nobody has addressed that issue at all in our leadership in the community. Is let's so, get tobacco out of the community. What, what, what question would you like to propose? Okay, but I want to get that out oh, no. along with the fact since they're so sincere about this. Okay. I, if I refuse to take this shot, will I be victimized or criminalized saying I have to carry a sign because I don't believe it's happening. So I would want to take a shot. 
So your your question is directed to a vaccine issue? The vaccine issue. All right, Dr. Strom, could you address that? Sure. Uh, so a couple of comments. One is, I strongly agree with your concern about tobacco. If we were able to remove tobacco from the market, we would we would eliminate something like half of all cancers, um, a huge proportion of heart disease, and of course lung disease, as you're alluding to. It's a it's a terrible terrible thing that we allow this to be be used publicly. I strongly agree with you. We are very slowly winning that war. Um, with the numbers of smokers are decreasing, but it's slow. And and if there were ways to be able to to do it more quickly. Personally, I would adore it. Um, it's a, you know, there are tobacco states that disagree with that. And they're, you know, and the state, any state government gets taxes from tobacco, which make, make it harder, but you are 100% correct. Uh, addressing the vaccine issue? Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of the vaccine, we don't have a vaccine yet. There are over a hundred candidate vaccines now being tested. Um, we hope that we will someday have a vaccine. Um, Ideally, it might be available if it's available in a year or so. More realistically, it might be two or three years. Um, but certainly no one has to take a vaccine if they don't want to. It's complete, it will be completely voluntary. On the other hand, for people like yourself that have lung disease, a vaccine becomes even more important. It's like a flu vaccine each year because it's people like yourself with lung disease and people who are uh, older, like yourself, like myself. I'm 75. Like I'm not that far from there <laughs> as well, who are at higher risk from these lung diseases like COVID-19, like influenza. And, and the, the, the shots help protect us from getting sicker. But if you don't want to take the shots, uh, the vaccines, you do not have to take vaccines. All right, Mr. Ellis. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon all and good afternoon to the doctor. My question uh, would be, dealing with community spread. I, I work in the community. I work with a community-based organization uh, here in Newark, uh, UVSO. They deal with hundreds and hundreds of children and thousands of parents just in one ward alone. But I'm concerned about community spread because we don't hear enough about community spread and people are now starting to go back out uh, even more. So doctor, could you just give us a little more information on community spread and how it can affect a whole generations of people? So great, great question. Um, when epidemics, pandemics like COVID start, we begin with what we, we call um, uh, uh, containment uh, before there's community spread. So you try to find out, each time there's a case, you try to find out where it came from where it came from before that and tried to try to limit it. And early on, there was no community spread. Most cases were coming from people who traveling from overseas or people who were near people from overseas. As the uh, epidemic um, became an epidemic and later a pandemic, um, uh, it, that happened by community spread. And, and the, the one person spreads it to another. You know, this virus is particularly bad in a number of ways. One of them is it is very contagious, uh, much more so than the flu is. The other difference is it's more serious than the flu. And yet another difference is you can pass it on even when you're not sick or before you're sick. So community spread becomes impossible to stop except by this lockdown where everybody stays in their home. And then as everybody stays in their home, it begins to die out and it begins to die down. And that's what we've seen in Northern Jersey. Newark has been a, a great example of that working. Um, if you look at the statistics, it's still increasing in South Jersey, but it's dramatically decreasing in North Jersey. And the goal of this economic lockdown is to try to block community spread until the point that it becomes feasible again to be able to try to trace case by case through testing, tracking, um, and and isolating people so that when people are sick or if they've been near people who've been sick, they're not out in the community spreading it to other people. Um, we keep them separate so they don't spread it to other, other people. It just, it got too far, it got too widespread. Uh, community spread was so enormous that there was no way to deal with it except for an economic lockdown. Unfortunately, 
Um, uh, well, fortunately, New Jersey has been handling it all very, very well. I think the governor has been doing a great job and the health commissioner. Unfortunately, some of our southern states are not doing it very well. And they're releasing their economies too much too early uh, when their cases are still increasing. And so that will guarantee us a second wave of community spread and probably a third wave and a fourth wave. People are talking about a second wave coming in the fall. It's not going to wait until the fall. There's no reason in the world, world to think it's going to wait until the fall. And, and so my prediction is, is that come June or July, we're going to have a second wave of community spread triggered by the fact that people are going out too soon. And if people in New Jersey start going to the beach too soon and don't maintain separation from each other, don't wear masks, don't do social isolation, it'll come sooner and it'll come worse. Wow. Uh, Ms. Smith-Gregory. President Smith Gregory. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you, Herb. I was on mute. Um, Dr. Strom, um, I heard you say that um, this pandemic was not a surprise and not new um, to you. And so my question is, um, my question is, what do you see ahead? And how can we be better prepared? You intimated that New Jersey was relatively repair, uh, prepared, but the nation as a whole was dramatically unprepared. Um, so do you have any, um, I would say, tips and pointers to give to us? Re well, the region is seems like we're handling it, but on a national scope because this is one country with contiguous states and we all have to work together because our humanity is our commonality. Great question. Um, so the, the reason I, first going backwards, the reason I saying it wasn't a surprise is because we as a country have been preparing and rehearsing for pandemics for decades. We've been expecting them. We had dress rehearsals, so to speak, with swine flu and Ebola and, and other things, none of which ended up as bad as it could have been, but we were preparing for it. And unfortunately, the uh, federal government um, dismantled a lot of that preparation. So that uh, when this one started, it was problematic because we weren't prepared. Um, we didn't have the store of supplies. We didn't have the ventilators. We didn't have, have the, the, the masks. We didn't have you know, lots of different things we weren't prepared for. Uh, it was also clear that when ch by the time China let it be public that this was happening, it was too late. It, it was already going to spread into the rest of the world. China did a dramatic, dramatic attempt to try to lock it down. Um, and it was never going to work completely. In retrospect, we especially know that because this disease passes even when you're not yet symptomatic. But it bought us probably two months that we wasted in terms of preparation, that we, we could have been more prepared for it. This is following exactly the, the what you'd expect from a respiratory infection. Uh, this is very similar in its course to the Spanish flu, which was 1918. Um, and it was clear in 1918, the, the cities like Philadelphia that didn't lock down were much worse. The cities that did lock down did much better. And, and, and that's, again, the course that we're following. New Jersey is doing the right thing now I, in locking down. Cases are dropping. Cases in Northern Jersey have dropped a lot. I mean, we had in the Barnabas system, uh, 1,600 cases in the whole system. We're now down to 1,000. University Hospital had 250. We're down to now, I think today it's 110 or 120. So it's way down, still lots of cases, a lot of bad sick people but it's dropping down in a nice way. We're doing the right thing by locking down. As we begin to open, we need to open with social distancing, staying away from each other, masks, uh, not going back to normal, not going on a beach or a park with people right next to each other. We need to keep doing that. Um, and, and again, the governor is, is, is providing us, us good guidance accordingly. Um, and we need, going back to the testing and tracing, we then need to find people who are still sick, pull them out of circulation, 
pull their contacts out of circulation to try to minimize the, the spread. There will still be community spread. There's still going to be additional cases uh, going, going forward, um, but we can try to minimize it. This isn't going to be a few month, a few week process or even a few month process. This is a few year process. Um, hopefully, hopefully we, and we're going to go in and out of this for, for a few years. If a vaccine can be developed, it will probably be at least a year from now, more likely 18 months to two years before it's developed and in widespread enough use to be able to be useful. And as I mentioned before, there's over a hundred candidate vaccines out there being developed all over the world. We're working on it also, but, but again, all over the world, so nothing unique, unique to us. We don't yet know there are diseases you can't vaccine, vaccinate against. We don't yet know whether antibodies help for this disease. For 95% of viruses, you, when you get sick, you form antibodies and you can't get the disease again. For 5% of viruses, you can get the disease again. And that 5% includes other coronaviruses. And there are concerning stories about people who got, seem to have gotten the disease more than once or seem to have gotten or got the disease and didn't develop antibodies or it looks like they have antibodies, but develop the disease again. This is still early stuff. This disease has only been around a few months, but if these concerning trends bear out, then a vaccine won't even be possible. And even herd immunity won't be possible. You know, what herd immunity is, is once you get from most viruses to somewhere between 50 to 70% of the population being sick, for measles, it's 90%, but once 50 to 70% have had the disease, then if somebody is in a disease, if I meet all of you and you've all been sick, if I'm sick, sorry, and you've all had the disease and have recovered, I can't pass it to you because you've had it already. So once enough people have had the disease, it dies down simply because enough people have had it. it um, that's what's referred to as herd immunity. That requires building antibodies and it's not clear whether that will happen here yet or not. We're hoping. 95% of viruses that works. The better way to get herd immunity is vaccination because people don't have to get sick to get, to get the herd immunity. But we don't know yet in terms of what, what'll happen. So this will either die down because so many of us get sick, 50 to 70%. It'll die down because we develop a vaccine, which is preferable, which again is probably at least a year, probably more like two or three years away. If that doesn't work, then and the good news is ultimately over time, viruses get less virulent. They become less serious, less likely to kill their host. So worse comes to worse in a few years, this becomes something like a cold that every year you, you, you can get. And in fact, many colds are coronavirus. Right. So, okay. so, so that's another alternative. Uh, we're uh, here on the Image Profile Report, and our special guest today is Dr. Brian Strom, who is the Chancellor of the Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences and the Executive Vice President for Health Affairs at Rutgers University. Uh, let me have a conversation uh, with you coming from um, Mr. Larry Hamm of the People's Organization for Progress. Um giving us your time and being on the program and giving us your expert opinion. Uh, I just wish the president of the United States would rely more on people like you and less on his uh, political cronies. Um, previous guests on this program and members of my organization who are nurses and staff at University Hospital have said that the staff at University Hospital have not received adequate PPE. I know this to be true because we have several members who are employees of the hospital who right now are in quarantine. I've also been informed that there have been deaths of staff members at the hospital who contracted the coronavirus. So my first question is, what is Sorry, I lost the last Going party to question. Going to you to make okay. sure the staff. Yes. What we is want to repeat the that, Larry, university Larry, hospital? Repeat it. Yeah, repeat your question. We we got to drop. Where did you lose me? At? Where, where did you lose me at, doctor? Where the did beginning. you lose me at? The beginning with the question. 
Oh, I got to go all the way back to the beginning. No, no. Oh, just all right. Here we go. Just a, just a question. <laughs> You're talking about PPE. How can right. Right. How personal protection? All right. How how can sorry. Um, how can we be sure people give have enough the staff who are putting their lives on the line to care for people? Mm. This question. So, what is the university hospital going to do to make sure the staff get the PPE they need to stay safe and healthy? My second question is: When a vaccine is developed, and you mentioned today there are at least a hundred and eight candidate vaccines. When these vaccines are tested and developed and ready to be used, will they be offered for free to all who need? Great, great question. So, so let me sort of back up first. Question your, this. I was standing in line at the at. Mm -hmm. oh. I was standing in line at the post office. Okay. Uh, that the corona that the that the coronavirus was developed in a lab. What can you say regarding the veracity of that statement? Great. Uh, thank you. A uh, bunch of different questions. Let me go back to the beginning and answer them one at a time. I think I took notes for each of them. Firstly, the question of expertise and expertise in Washington. I strongly agree with you. Um, I I'll, I'll, I'll give you the advice that I gave. My wife, um, Tony Fauci, is terrific. I have known him for many years. Pay attention to what he says. Pay attention also to what he doesn't say. Yes. He'll, he'll never say something that isn't true, mm -hmm. but when he doesn't answer a question, there's a reason mm -hmm. that he's not being allowed to answer a question or not being allowed to give a, a straight answer. So he, he's completely credible but, but watch also what he doesn't answer in addition to what he does answer. That gives you information as well. Um, mm -hmm. um, in terms of PPEs, um, a lack of PPEs has been a nationwide problem. Um, and again, to make sure the, the audience all, all knows, I'm sure this, this panel knows, but PEs, PPEs are personal protective equipment. Healthcare workers use it, spe special masks, they're called N95s um, to protect you. Um, uh, uh, visors to protect you, gowns to protect you, uh, gloves to protect you, um, for uh, healthcare workers to try to take care of people who are sick without PPEs are like sending an army into war without bullets, um, and especially with, without armor ar around the tanks. It's horrendous, it's abysmal. It has been an absolute disgrace in, the, in this country that, that that has happened. Nothing unique to University Hospital. It has been a national phenomenon and it goes back to the national um, supply issue and preparedness issue. Unfortunately, part of the, what happened is we moved as a country to a supply for PPEs that mostly came from China. So when China was cut off, we couldn't get PPEs and we didn't have stockpiles. We had not built large enough stockpiles. In healthcare, normally you change those masks with every patient. Nowadays, we're giving people masks to wear one a day. And even that's not enough We've had to develop and we've used our labs in, in, in Newark to help sterilizing uh, procedures. So be, in, because rather than throw these masks away, which should be cheap things that you throw away after each patient, um, because they've been so scarce, at the end of a day, we sterilize them in order to use them for later, later days uh, as well. It, it's horrendous that our healthcare workers have had to, to go through this. But you will still be able to provide them at no cost. And as we recognize, oh, yeah. you know, there are, there are a lot of situations that are occurring where individuals are actually uh, being uh, retaliated against for speaking up about the disparity that's going on with equipment. And uh, we wanted to understand to make sure that the administration is very cognizant of knowing that it's not a good thing for us to hear that an individual is getting fired because they want to get protected. Um, I didn't ask that question, and I'm not going to ask that question. Yeah. What I'm going to do is refer this moment to Mr. Gregory Glenn. 
Hello. First of all, thank you so much for your love of expertise. Learned a lot, even from a young person, understanding how the coronavirus and everything is being taken care of. My question is um, two part. The first is a medical question. The second is a, from a financial perspective. The first question is in the future, especially when a vaccine is found, do you feel that young people um, will have the same level of risk exposure as the older generation? And do you feel that the COVID-19 will mutate into other forms of viruses. Um, I'll ask the financial question as well, because one of the things that I focus on a lot, especially when I'm dealing with retirement planning, is long-term care, critical, and um, chronic um, financial planning. Due to this coronavirus um, epidemic, how prepared do you feel that Americans, specifically um, minority communities, were in preparing for medical expenses associated with COVID-19? And do you feel that the health insurers are doing an adequate job in providing coverage during this pandemic? Great, great questions. In terms of the vaccine, well, personally, in terms of young people in general, young people need to realize they are not immune from this. And, and the importance of young, for young people is twofold. One is, even if you don't get sick from it, you can give it to your parents, to your grandparents, to, your, to, to, to others who will get very sick from it. And second, there are plenty of young people who've gotten very sick from it. So, so the idea that, that I'm young, therefore I can go to the bar and I can go to the beach and I can do everything and, and ignore social distancing is, is wrong. Um, once the vaccine is available, it should be for everybody. It should be for everybody in the country. Certainly, um, a, you know, you, it'll probably start with healthcare workers because they're at highest risk as we were just talking about, people getting sick, mm -hmm. healthcare workers getting sick, and because they also may give it to patients. It'll start with elderly people, people in nursing homes, the same kind of population will be getting the testing in. But the goal will be to vaccinate everybody who wants it as fast as possible. The more we can do it as fast as we can do it, the, the better it will be for the, for the country. But we're, we're a ways off. Again, that's at least a year, probably closer to 18 months or two years. Uh, there hasn't been a vaccine that hasn't taken four years or more to develop. There are some diseases that you can never develop a vaccine for. Can it mutate? Yes, this virus mutates like all viruses mutate. Um, it's been mutating a little bit more slowly, which is uh, nice from a vaccine point of view, but it is certainly possible that by the time a vaccine is available, there will be mutated forms available that the vaccine won't work against. Mm. In the same way as the flu we vaccinate every year because there are different forms of the flu, it could be that that is the case here too. That, that you need repeated vaccinations in order to be able to, to cover. We just don't know yet. You know, the vaccines are being produced against a part of the virus that we think is constant, doesn't mutate. That if that mutated, it, people would, wouldn't get sick anymore. But we don't know that. And we don't even know whether a vaccine will work. But once it's available, clearly, if it works, um, uh, or they work, because again, there's lots of candidates out there. Clearly, we want everybody in the world vaccinated for this. Um, um, as, as soon as possible. You don't want to give it, for example, to infants until you test it for safety in infants. And you, know, you don't want to give it in pregnant women until you test it for safety in pregnant women. But certainly young people will, will not be, they may not get it as fast as people in nursing homes would get it, mm -hmm. um, but, 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 but they clearly uh, should uh, get it, absolutely. You asked what, about me medical care, medical expenses. I think our entire health insurance system is flawed. I think Obamacare helped but it, may, it was a patch. It was a vast improvement over what we normally have. But we have a system in the country where 25% of healthcare expenses are spent on overhead for insurance companies. And yet we still have a large number of people with no insurance. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, are people uh, insured appropriately for it? Some are, some aren't, and that's unfair. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about what the Congress did in terms of testing is it is theoretically providing money so everyone can get tested for free. Wow. I, can, I can tell you being involved in doing a lot of testing, it's hard to find that money for, for some people. So people who are well insured, they can get the test for free. The insurance companies, Horizon others have said, no deductible, you can get it, it's not an issue. What about uninsured people? It wasn't until this bill was just passed last week that there was money to be able to do testing in uninsured people. So am I confident that insurance that our insurance system more broadly will provide vaccines fairly to everybody in the country. 
I, that's going to be a political decision. I certainly ho hope so, but there's certainly no guarantee. Past behavior doesn't uh, guarantee that. The one thing mm -hmm. that will make it perhaps more likely is because if you don't vaccinate everybody, you put everybody at risk. Dr. Okay. And, let me yeah. let me let me refer my last uh, opportunity for the round, uh, and get uh, the uh, chairperson of the Criminal Justice Committee, Mr. Rick Robinson. In uh, Rick, uh, would you like to ask a question? Listen, um, I want to thank everybody for being on this panel. This is very very important. Um, another thing is, um, Dr. Strong, we really applaud your efforts and your leadership, and we're looking at. Um, your situation pertaining to steering us in a um, uh, element or a direction which is going to help us um, preserve life. That's very important. All right, so my question will be, what would be the best situation regarding forming people? Because I, I think that... Um, I know there's a lot going on with COVID-19, doctor. Um, for right now, can we get something from your office so we can actually facilitate it out to all the different um, organizations, uh, leadership on this uh, panel to pretty much send out to our contacts, residents, networks pertaining to how to preserve life? Because we already know the situation at University Hospital. We already hear the stories uh, throughout the nation. We just need something so we can assure the residents of this great state, this is what you should be practicing. And if it's coming from your office and you're spearheading this FDA approval for the uh, saliva testing, I think it will have some validation and it will be very much valued. Um, can I, we actually get something from your office? Yes, I can certainly generate something uh, uh, accordingly. And, and just to... Um, emphasize and yeah yes the answer is yes but but the you know the Thank you. the state has been doing a good really good job at sort of you know what is the best thing you can do now stay at home the state the mayor the health department but but we can certainly generate something that that, that, that you can circulate great great uh miss smith gregory um i wanted to just circle back to uh dr strom's um, Stan, do you advocate universal health care? Um, personally, politically, yes. And and I I, I would think, um, you know, being now of Medicare age myself, Medicare is a great program, and its overhead is much cheaper than the overhead of, of private health insurance. Um, is it politically viable? I don't think it is, unfortunately. And and I think that Obamacare was an important major step forward. Um, in in order to be able to go to to uh, to get to to uniform universal health care. So whether it's by Medicare for all, whether it's by any other mechanism, I think everybody in the public uh, should absolutely have have health insurance. The mechanism is less important than than the fact that everybody gets insured because people who aren't insured don't come for medical care; they get sick. I mean, it's really in, inappropriate. Wow, Larry Ham. Uh, I just want to thank the doctor, and I'm I, I, I'm going to re-ask one of my earlier questions. Um, when the vaccine is developed, will it be free to all who need it? I, you know, and I think the simple answer is, that, um, I hope so, but it's certainly not in my control. So wow. I I'm, I'm I really apo apologize. My wife has just locked herself out. I'll be back in about. 15 seconds. <laughs> hey, listen, everyone. I think that this is definitely <laughs> a very positive opportunity for us to uh, I'm on television. A, a, uh, um, a chance at uh, challenging the relationship that we can improve in regard to how um, health care is being handled here in our community. And I applaud each of you for participating and taking part. You, you're relatively bringing out some very good issues and um, a lot of things that people in our community don't find as a priority. And we really appreciate uh, Dr. Strom, but continue Dr. Strom. Sure, yeah, and again, I apologize for the interruption. The, the, the trouble with being at home, 
Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I know the, the, yeah, the realities of life. Um, but but yeah, but the, you want vaccines to be available to everybody. That would be an automatic part if we had universal health insurance. Um, certainly my hope would be just like Congress passed laws saying that testing should be available to everybody, um, that the vaccine should be available to everybody. Um, I'm more optimistic about that than about universal health care, universal insurance in general, for the reasons I talked about before, because it's in the self-interest of everybody in the country for everybody to get vaccinated because we protect each other. Ms. Uh, Sharif. Um, very holistic. And uh, I believe that this is a sham. I really do. I'm sorry, we, we missed the first part of your question. I don't believe that this is really happening. I don't believe, I explained that to you yesterday, that I don't believe what we're going through is actually what we're going through. So, uh, Dr. Strom, I think the relative issue is that our community is not being educated well enough on the reaction in regard to the pandemic. We have a number of different viruses and in, in much of the relationship, there, there certainly hasn't been a vaccine for any of them. What is it that made this one so important that we have to go back to, I would say old school. These, these are remedies that were used back uh, during the Spanish flu and even in as much for, you know, the, uh, the, black, uh, the black plague. What can you address that? And uh, is it relatively linked to what Mr. Robinson was talking about. Um, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right about it, all of what you're saying. So let, let me clarify what, what, what I mean. The approaches we're using, you know, we don't have good treatment yet. We don't have a vaccine yet. The approaches we're using are the same approaches that were used exactly, as you said, uh, for the Spanish flu and the Black Plague. These are very old fashioned approaches to dealing with epidemics. So why is this one different? Uh, why is it different than, than the, say, the flu every year or colds every year or, or other things? There's really a, a few key reasons why it's different. One is we don't have a vaccine. We have a vaccine for the flu. We don't have a vaccine for this, at least not yet. Second is the, the uh, case fatality rate of everybody who gets it, the number of people who die is at least tenfold, maybe 20 or 30 fold higher than the flu. So people are much more likely to die from this than from the flu if they get the disease. The third difference is this is much more contagious than the flu. It's much easier to spread this from person to person. And that's why you see these dramatic increases that we started. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but this epidemic just started two months ago. Um, and, and, and think of, of what has happened. So you know now things are getting better. When it starts getting worse again in the second wave, it will be just as go be just as fast. Um, and the other key difference here compared to a disease like the flu or Ebola or other, uh, otherwise is it can be passed when you're uh, not yet symptomatic. So somebody who looks completely healthy to you can give you this disease. You know, it, we, the Ebola was hard to catch. It was a terrible disease, um, uh, but, it's, but it was hard to catch. This is a respiratory disease. People coughing, people sneezing, just talking. Um, can give it to other, uh, other people, even when you're not yet sick. So this has a uniquely bad characteristics in a number of ways and kills people. And even the people who aren't killed can be very sick. People can be in the ICU for weeks. People can be on ventilators for weeks. One of the, one of the nice things I, I'm delighted to say, and it goes back to my comment about the state being prepared, there isn't a person in New Jersey who died due to lack of a hospital bed, lack of an ICU bed, or lack of a ventilator. And we never had to move like New York did to more than one person on a ventilator. And we never had to make choices like Italy had to do of taking people off ventilators to make room for other people on, on ventilators. So the state handled it really well, but we came very, very close <clears throat> and, and, and all these things. And, wow. and it, it's a, we were just right at the threshold. Doctor, there's a belief, Dr. Strom, there's a belief in our community. I, I had tried to say this earlier. I was online at the post office on Saturday and a conversation struck up and I was just listening. I wasn't even in conversation, but
but there's a belief by many in our community that this um, coronavirus was developed in a lab and is really the, the product of um, uh, uh, scientific manipulation. Can you speak to this, the veracity of that? I can. That, that is a statement being put forward by our national politicians looking for an excuse to cover the fact that they didn't do their job. Um, um, and it, it is 99% it is not true. Um, you've got people like Tony Fauci saying it's not true. You've got the best scientists saying it's not true. You've got the, the um, uh, intelligence community, even in the US, saying it's not true. You've got the intelligence communities looking at other parts of the, in the other parts of the world saying it's not true. And when you look at the organism itself and you look at what it looks like under a microscope and in testing, it doesn't look like something that was changed from natural. It looks like something that mutated from a bat virus um, and got spread from bats to people, maybe through another uh, organism. People have speculated about pangolins. We don't know that, but but just like other viruses have come, um, uh, you know, via from animals to people, um, the, it, 99% chance this one did also. That that rumor is is widely spread now, being spread by our politicians looking to mislead people. Ms. Gregory. Thank you for, for that clarity. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, can you give us some idea about how you said maybe June, July, that there might be a second wave. Can you give us some idea about how we can prepare ourselves? There are so many people who are not going outside. Um, and as the governor who has, done, who has shown strong leadership says around May 15th, with the weather being what it is um, and getting warmer, people do have a need to be outside. Can you give some tips and pointers about what we can expect in the summer, if you're aware of that, what we can expect, how we need to behave to ensure that this, that we don't create a surge, that we keep it flattening. Great, great question. I think as we begin to lock, un, to release and to unlock down, I think social distancing remains critical, meaning don't be within six feet of other people, wear masks, uh, wash hands frequently, keep separate. Uh, from people, don't be in crowds. Um, uh, the restaurants, if we open restaurants at all, should be places where you can sit far apart. Classes, if we open our classes at Rutgers at all, we're gonna do it in a way that students can sit far apart from each other. Distancing is key. Um, and try to keep, have people stay away because we can't tell who's sick and who's not sick. And somebody who is carrying the disease can spread it to other people. If you're far enough away from them, you can be outside. You can exercise, you can be in parks, you can be in beautiful places and still be outside, but not have to be right next to people who are st strangers of yours. The other thing I would do, and this gets back to the question that was asked before about PPEs, stock up on supplies. Now, as they're available, there will be later waves, there will be issues. I don't mean PPEs, save them for the healthcare workers because they're gonna need it as hospitals stock up preparing for the next wave, the, uh, the second wave, third wave accordingly. But regular masks, food, you wanna be able to, to uh, be in a position where you don't have to go out of your house more than necessary. The, the, um, so uh, um, enjoy the nice weather, enjoy going outside, but still keep apart from other people. Let me get this last question in, Dr. Strom, and we really appreciate the time that you have, and our panelists have just been stellar in relationship to their relationship of being positive and uh, getting real answers that are important to our community heard. One of the issues that has become evident publicly is that there have been doctors that are being furloughed, individuals that are being fired or raising awareness about the discomfort of not having enough materials. And we are very concerned about that. Uh, if it has happened, we, we strongly uh, would like to hear whether or not uh, it's going to change. 
And uh, if it hasn't, we want to know how you are protecting it from happening. It's a great question. I've, I've read about that in the newspaper too. I can tell you it has not happened in any of our, in Rutgers Health. It has not happened to my knowledge at Robert Wood Johnson uh, uh, medical, medical School or Health System in general, but it has happened at other places. I think the need for PPEs is key. Um, quite the opposite, we have made a commitment to the state, we, Rutgers, has made a commitment to the state that we will not lay off, uh, um, you know, we're in a financial mess like the rest of the economy, but we will not lay off any healthcare workers. We need in the state every healthcare worker uh, uh, that, that is in place. Anyone delivering care to COVID patients will, will, will not be laid off. Certainly people have not been disciplined that I know of in our system um, the, the, because of speaking out against PPE, not having PPEs. People, um, uh, shortages of PPEs are real. Um, but the, and, and again, as you alluded to before, certainly should be provided free, should be provided to, to, to healthcare workers uh, uh, accordingly. But, but it's a, um, I have seen news reports of those things, but not in any of our uh, systems. Your value, the oh. kind of uh, investment that you have brought to this community is uh, so enlightening that you would take the time to spend with us who are not mainstream media, who really are the boots on the ground. And uh, we, we are certainly um, uh, respectful to what we can be able to do to help encourage more of these kinds of conversations. And uh, as I, as you can hear, Minister Ellis wants yeah. to say something, and I'm going <laughs> to give him his, his due. Go on, Minister Ellis. No, no, no I, 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 have, I have one last question. Uh, sure. For good doctor. And again, thank you for this time. And I'm quite sure we all appreciate it. The information is most important uh, for everybody that's watching. My question is dealing with vaccines and vaccinations. I, again, I work with children in the pre-K level. And all the children, when we register, have to have certain shots. They have to have varicella, MMR. They have to have a physical. Do you see down the line that the children, in order to attend pre-K and even other schools, will have to have a COVID-19 shot to enter school? I hope so. Um, um, and let me explain what I mean by that. Um, first, we need the availability of vaccine. We need to know the vaccine is safe and effective in anybody. Then we need to know it's safe and effective in children, which is which is different than everybody else. I think that um, in some ways it's less important in children uh, because they're not the ones who are dying from this. But the importance of giving it to children is to protect their parents and grandparents and neighbors. So the, the children would be the last who would get it rather than the first who would get it. But if we have a good enough vaccine and a safe enough vaccine that's good enough for, for children as well, then, then my hope would be it, it would be uh, used and required in children as well. But we're years away from that. Dr. Strom, um, when uh, the opportunity comes that it will become universal uh, testing and uh, the opportunity uh, to be a part of it uh, from a community outreach perspective, Will you be willing to come back on the show and share with us uh, what type of way we can be assistance to you? Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime. It would be useful to you. And I just got uh, another one of my uh, panelists. Uh, uh, Professor uh, John Smith is on the line with us. And John, I just want to hear your voice and find out if there's anything uh, you want to direct to Dr. Strong before we wrap up. Not at this late date, no. Thank no. you. Thank, thank all of you. Okay. All right. Well, listen, this is the Image Profile Report, and we have had the opportunity to be able to speak with uh, one of the pioneers involved with the study and the development of a remedy to the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, we have been able to speak with Dr. Brian Strom, who is the inaugural chancellor of the Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences and the Executive Vice President of Health Affairs at Rutgers University. On our panel today, we have had the President of the Newark NAACP, uh, Deborah Smith Gregory. Uh, we have uh, been able to have also from the NAACP and the representative for the state conference, Mr. Rick Robinson, 
We have uh, community leaders, uh, Mr. Thomas Ellis and Ms. Jahada Sharif. Uh, we have had Mr. Gregory Glenn from the financial community. And um, we have been able to come together once again and have a opportunity to present our concerns. And we're looking forward to having more of these opportunities to be able to bring awareness of issues that are important for our community. Once again, we thank you, Dr. Strom, and we look forward to having another opportunity to be able to talk with you and find out what we can do to support what you're doing here in New Jersey and in the city of Newark. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. Okay. And to all of you who are, were able to watch the show, and we want you to share it, hit the share button, and, uh, and make sure that other people get this interesting knowledge that we have been able to bring before you. Thank you again, and, and have a good day. Mr. Glenn? Greg?